Oh my God. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you for coming on Real Pod. I'm honored. I remember growing up listening to your music. When I saw you write a memoir, I was like, yes, give us the tea. Tell us everything. I've been dying to know. Well, I love you. I, <laughs> I am familiar with your pod and I just love your energy. I love what you put out there. You and your mom. <laughs> you, you guys just make me so happy. I will never hear the end of her saying, Jojo brought me up in the first 10 seconds. <laughs> That's going to be her new thing. Oh, you guys are so cute. But congratulations. It's a big deal to sit down and pretty much pour your life story into words on a piece of paper and not only just do that for like your own cathartic purpose, but then to let the world into that story as well. And I loved, you wrote in the beginning that now felt like the best time to shed the fear, the embarrassment, the judgment of the world that you said you felt like was almost a second skin. So mm. why right now? And how does it feel that the world's begun to read it? I just didn't want to wait anymore. I, I'm 20 years into my career as a recording artist. And at 33, to be able to say that, I just kind of wanted to celebrate these 20 years and also get some shit out of the way, <laughs> off my chest. Like I, I grew up going to AA meetings with both my parents. And I think that the catharsis that I saw in those rooms of people just being just completely raw and letting it all hang out pretty much kind of inspired me to be like, that's how you do it. That's mm -hmm. how you keep moving on is by, is by being vulnerable and is um, taking accountability and is sharing. Mm -hmm. So I, I had been so like afraid or so felt all those things that you said. I just did. I don't want to live that way anymore. Yeah. I heard someone say recently, vulnerability allows no one else to use you against you. Yes. And I loved it. Me too. I love that. And yeah. I, I think that that's what made me feel like doing this as well. Like um, there's something empowering about that vulnerability. Totally. And I devoured your book in two and a half days. That is crazy. Thank you. Thank you of for course. reading it. Of course. No, I can't even imagine what that feels like. Because when people tell me they listen to like my 40 minute podcast, I'm like, oh my God, totally. my day's made. And here it yes. is like over 200 page 300 pages of a book of your life so I can only I'm imagine. honored that you that you read it and and it is crazy to know that like this thing that I've just been like <laughs> for you know a year and a half that it's now just out of my freaking out about it and that it is it's to be shared and I respected the hell out of you taking so much pride and writing every word I literally at the end you're like yeah dog Randy Jackson I'm like <laughs> I'm dying I'm like she did write this <laughs> I mean, look, I, there's something to be said for having help. Like I, you know, I, this was my first time doing anything like this, but just after everything that, um, after, after the past 20 years, I'm like, if I'm going to tell my story, I'm going to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. First of all, when you started the book saying you pretty much grew up in AA rooms, I was like, okay, I already love you. I have mad respect for people who are in AA, who me have, too. who've been to Al-Anon meetings. Mm -hmm. I've been to Al-Anon meetings. Yeah, me too. It is so inspiring. And there's like little nuggets you take that can apply to all areas of your life. But I was thinking, you know, to tell your story, you also have to tell other people's stories. And obviously your mom's a big part of the book. So I'm curious if like you guys sat down and what she, how she felt. Yeah, that was one of the hardest things in that if you're telling your story, there are the people that are in it. And I told her that I was going to be writing a book about my life. And I was like, Ma, you're obviously a big part of it. And the thing is, I'm so proud of my mom and her sobriety. And she, to me, is an example that if you want to change your life, you want to change the way you look at things, you can. She's an example of that. And that's inspired me. But it's, there's been a lot of darkness too, mm -hmm. a lot of confusion, a lot of accusation, a lot of me, a lot of us really, really being disappointed with each other at different times. And I asked her if, you know, uh, there were some things that I could share and she kind of gave me her blessing. And as I was, re you know, doing the edit, I wanted her to be a part of it. And she was like, I, I don't know if I want to read it. So, but she's, She's read it, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I believe that our story, not just mine, our story will hopefully inspire people and make them feel less alone. Because I felt very alone growing up in that dynamic of um, 
having this outward success and then feeling like my family life was so shaky Mm -hmm. Um, and like I just didn't really know where to who to trust or I think from the outside looking in if someone said guess Jojo's childhood or guess like the family dynamic I never think I would have been able to come up with what the reality was but really you had this God-given gift mom's a singer so it's in the family and you just are like destined to be on stage and really the one pushing it and I admire your mom for being like I have no idea how to help my child pursue their passion in life but we're going to figure it out as we go and of course there's going to be ups and downs and moments where we're not how we want to be. Absolutely. And in retrospect, I mean, I was so harsh on her, I think, especially as a teenager, as a lot of us are with our moms. I don't know if you were, because I know you're close with your mom. We've had our moments, for sure. That makes you close. It makes you close, yeah. And I was really hard on her. But now, as, you know, an adult, I look back and I'm just like, how terrifying must it have been for her to be a single mom with this only child who is doing this weird thing and who people are, you know, just giving so much attention to and saying, you're so great and here you want, you want this and that and, you know, fly to LA from Boston and, you know, all these things left and right that we just didn't really have a precedent for. It must have been terrifying. Mm-hmm. And I think she did a really great job of making sure she tried really hard to make sure that I could be a person and not just a product. Mm -hmm. That was her priority. And that's more than a lot of people who started out young can say. Yeah. You know, I love that you talk about how your mom was constantly popping your ego bubble. I think a lot of parents, especially in that industry are telling their child, you deserve that. You should get this. And it was very much the opposite. (laughs) But Honestly, you're so down to earth and normal that it's like... Oh, God, I don't know about that. Really? I I, I mean, sometimes I'm like, am I okay? Like, I just feel so weird, but... I feel like we're all that way every day. Am I okay? Am I well? Totally. How would you describe when you were a child who wanted to pursue, like, becoming a famous singer, what what was it that was, like, making you at such a young age, like, six years old, seven years old, like, want to go out onto these stages, sing on national television walk into these really intimidating rooms and do these impressions because not everyone is born with that. Yeah, I have no fucking idea. (laughs) I was so just lit from within and I saw both my parents singing. I saw my idols on TV. I mean, there's this video of me. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's like, it, it makes the rounds every once in a while where it's like, here's little Jojo doing, I did like, a, a growl like anyway I'm trying to be like Christina Whitney and Mariah in one in the span yeah. of like a verse <laughs> at like eight years old and I'm like <laughs> like that's how I sang I'm sorry I'm deceased <laughs> I'm, I'm deceased but how weird if I was you I would never shut the fuck up and I'll be singing all the time <laughs> I I just love I, I love sound right was that you trying to be bad sorry I'm just still <laughs> taking it back. To, that was me trying to <laughs> do like the most yeah I just felt like I wanted to do the most as a little kid and I think you know I also say in the book how my doctor thought I should be medicated you know like a kid who was yeah. this precocious or this outgoing would definitely be diagnosed with ADHD today or, or be on the spectrum of something and um I'm grateful that my mom was like no she's just special yeah you know what I mean as opposed to being like you're right it's too much right so yeah I was just I saw an ad in the newspaper in the Boston Globe and was like, Ma, I'm a talented kid. They they said they're looking for talented <laughs> kids. Like, that's, I don't, you know, I don't know. So you begin making the rounds and going on different TV shows, singing on radio stations. People at home and school are knowing, okay, uh, Joanna, like, she's got a talent. She's going for this thing. Yeah. So much so that Britney Spears offered to sign you. And I thought, oh, my God, I never knew she was signed by Britney. To keep reading and find out that that was something your mom didn't feel like you were ready for at a young age. What was it like for you to think America's pop star Mm -hmm. wants to sign me, but we're not going through with it? Well, I thought my mom was trying to ruin my life. (laughs) I was like, Ma, this is as good as it gets. This fucking Britney Spears. This is... And then Larry Rudolph, like I, you know, I, I was a, like, I watched all the behind the scenes of all that stuff. I watched all the VH1 things and MTV things. And I wanted to know like, okay, who manages these people? Who are their lawyers? I, I just liked it all. Right. And so when she, when my mom was like, you're too young, I'm like, this is never like, this is never going to happen again. Cause I think I was 10 or, or something. 
and Brittany had just started out and it seemed like everything seems like it's, you know, what you should do and, um, and everything seems like the end of the world when you're 10, at least to yeah. me. I was very dramatic. Well, in hindsight, your initial singles of Leave Get Out, Baby It's You, your your initial JoJo album would not have happened. Like, had you have signed with Britney? I know. It's like a whole everything everywhere all at once or sliding doors. Like, if you had taken this step, what, what, what would it have been like? It's such a, like a mind warp because... Obviously, like you went through the ringer with contracts and not being able to release music and like. Yeah, but if I had not signed to the label I signed to, I would not be sitting here with you today. I would not yes. have a career. It was because of their vision. It was because of their belief in me. It was because of the necessity of the moment of them needing a success and me wanting it too. And, right. and me being like, I just want to sing and them believing in me. Like it takes yeah. that belief and that passion and that. All of it. I believe belief is the most powerful force. Belief in love, mm -hmm. you know, can really move things, change things. And their belief, you know, I just, I wouldn't have the life that I have if it weren't for their belief. I think a, a lot of people for a while, at least the narrative it felt like around me was like, she was a victim of, you know, the music industry. I just don't feel like that. You know, life isn't as simple as that. Like there's so many different things. And I love those people. They mm -hmm. were... Everything happens for a reason. As I was reading, I almost was like waiting for a sentence in that framework of maybe like pointing fingers or saying I was taken advantage of. And I know in your opening, you talk about like, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not blaming anyone. Like life can't be quantified into this like quick two sentence story. No. But at the same time, you were so young and in the moments you trusted, like when they said Leave Get Out will be your first single. And, you and I'm glad I did. You didn't like it. I didn't. When you said my mom was crying, she thought it was the worst thing we could do. I was like, stop, not the song. You know they played it in my berries this morning? Oh, did they? No, it was like a God wink. Taste. I was that literally- is a God wink. You say God wink? Yes. Me too. I was like, stop. Aww. I'm literally interviewing her tonight. They're not playing this song on the tread. Hey, and my so husband crazy. Max was like looking at me. Oh, and like, that's <laughs> so cute. And something I thought was interesting is throughout your whole memoir- it seems like you had a really good sense of like what you liked and what you didn't like, but we're still kind of allowing other people to then like turn the wheel. Yes, 100%. <laughs> so I'm curious, like what do you chalk up the disconnect of? <laughs> <laughs> Why did you do that? Well, no, but because I think it's, I think it's so common, right? And I can't like buy yes. something without asking my mom if she likes it or doesn't like it. Oh, yeah. Or bring a piece of furniture in and like she's going to come over and I'm like, if she doesn't say anything about it, she fucking hates it. <laughs> Totally. So I, I totally. empathize with it. Yeah, I think. Are you a millennial? I don't even know. Okay. Well, I, I just think that. <laughs> I, I think I'm. Yeah. I think that youngish women, this is something that we need to overcome. A lot of us are actively working on it. You know what I mean? And that's why the title over the influence, not just the nod to being under the influence and some substance abuse themes that are in my life, even before I came into this world, just my family of origin and everything, but also in my own. But also just the influence of other of trusting other people over your own self, mm -hmm. over your own body, signaling to you, I fucking hate this. I feel stupid. I feel completely disassociated. I feel like I'm numb. I, I feel disconnected. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I ignored that for so long because I just so desperately wanted acceptance. Mm. And even just from the close-knit people around me, my team, the label, fans, whatever. But I learned through so much trial and error and banging my head against the wall and doing the same thing and expecting it to feel different, not listening to, you know, just like, uh, this isn't right, that um, I just simply can't do it anymore. I just can't live for what other people think I should be doing. Mm-hmm. I'm having a thought and my friends and I love to like therapist with each other. I don't know if you do that. And you're like, I think you're projecting this deep need. Bring to it on. Okay, I kind of have a, I have a thought. Do you wonder if because you at 11, 12 years old are like having these big conversations that are about something you will do now that will affect the rest of your life? Because you're talking about like your first album, your first single, that there was just such big decisions that any kid would look to adults 100 percent. i never wanted to be a kid i never felt accepted really by by kids my age i was bullied a lot and i felt always like the other i felt like 
the big loser. I, I just did. And then and then when fame came into my life, then it was like, oh, y'all fuck with me now? Like, yeah. confusing. And also, like, I, I just developed even more of a disconnect, I think, from what is the truth? What do people really think about mm -hmm. me? How can I be acceptable to people? Because I was never really accepted in school. And I think that all those little things that we think don't matter as, as kids – they all add up to a sense of self. Mm -hmm. And that's what I believe is the danger is too much of a word, but the it can be a consequence of starting out so young in the industry. I have no regrets of starting as young as I did because I believe everything happens for a reason. But if someone were to ask my advice, I would never, ever recommend that someone started as young as I did mm -hmm. because you don't have a sense of self. You, there's no way. So you're a fragile mushy brain is being formed by what other people are telling you by all these um environments that are really weird and fake and um you just don't go through those normal kind of markers that I think kids need to go to mm -hmm. and need to go through mm -hmm. yeah speaking of your first singles so we have leave get out then we have baby it's you bops also <laughs> by the way i please know jojo i'm or, sorry joanna as oh, i was whatever. reading i was yeah, like i want to call her joanna oh that's sweet F that like that that's her name <laughs> it is um, name. but sorry it's just so ingrained but um joanna like when you said you wanted um how to touch a girl to be the single mm -hmm. i was like are you grateful oh, okay yes i know i know Do you the, care yeah, what's on, on my mind <laughs> yes such a good song thank you um so and it's, it was even fun looking back at the videos and your first albums being like oh my god i remember like getting ready for my sixth grade dance and listening oh. to this but i wonder if you now when you look back do you think you were over sexualized when you were younger I mean not really because I see kids these days I'm like damn yeah that's true <laughs> no, that's I don't know true. I don't really think so I mean I was talking with some of my girlfriends yesterday and one of them was like we they hadn't seen the how to touch a girl video she was in Australia and she, she never saw it and um she was like oh my oh my god how, how do Australians say it <laughs> right she, right she was like that is so cheeky yeah. and I'm like oh my god it is but that's just not how we meant it it was like how to touch her heart so I don't know we towed the line a lot between like a little cheek a little button up yeah like it wasn't that and crazy. I, I don't think that I'm just I'm just curious because you probably have to do a lot of processing looking back because you were like so in it at the time yeah that I was curious and then it was interesting hearing you talk about filming music videos and feeling insecure and a little anxious and not super confident and then I literally would go to watch the video just in prep for this and none of that came through and I think it just goes to show you never know how anyone's feeling 100% that's what I always try to keep in mind I don't always keep it in the front of my mind but when someone's acting weird or whatever I'm like I or doing something that I don't like or agree with I'm like I have no idea what they're going through or just because someone is perceived as confident or even arrogant I'm like I wonder if they're actually insecure yeah because I felt that way and sometimes I struggle with how I feel on the inside and completely n being told that I'm projecting something totally different that I'm often projecting confidence and poise and rigidness or something and I'm like wow, I feel like I'm a fucking sad turtle inside. Right, I don't right, really know right. how to bridge this gap yeah. between how I feel and what I'm projecting. It's it's really weird. Yeah. It's really weird, but but that was my job. And I knew I had a job. And I knew that, like, this was my first video. Or these are all my videos. And right. I, I wanted to, like... And I had a great team around me that was like, yes, kitten, drink the milk. Like, you know, <laughs> perform, be a superstar, bitch. And I'm like, yes, you know, so excited. Yeah. So that's... I was scared, but also it's on the other side of being scared is something awesome. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with that, with like feeling fear and showing up and doing your best anyway. Mm -hmm. That's how I was thinking about it. Another reason I was so excited to read over the influence was because I think like a lot of people, you know, I saw you in Aquamarine and RV and when your first album came out and was so successful and you're so talented and something you talk about is how while we all saw the potential, the trajectory wasn't necessarily like how most people would predict it to be. And yeah. as I'm reading and seeing how there's almost like, I think there was like 10 years between the second album and the third, of course, music released in between, but you really were like 
not able to do exactly what you wanted. And it was frustrating to read. I can't even imagine how frustrating it was to be yourself recording hundreds of songs and working, working, working and not getting to do what you wanted to do. How did that feel kind of going through that decade? Something that my family always instilled in me, because we come from a small town in Massachusetts, it was always like your work ethic is what's most important. Like people need to see that you're a hard worker and that you show up on time and that you're respectful and all these things. And so I think what really bothered me is that people thought that I was just chilling. That just for 10 years, I was just like doing whatever I wanted. And I was breaking myself, trying to put out music and trying to make sure that my career didn't completely crash and burn. Mm. Trying, trying to do whatever I could to make things work with my record label. Um, and also like numbing myself out, you know, along that way too, because I was so deeply depressed, so confused. I just constantly felt between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, when you sign a contract, you it's legally binding, mm-hmm. even if you're 12 years old. And there was so much confusion. There was so much that people couldn't tell me what was happening. Mm-hmm. So to write and record hundreds of songs, to always be in the studio, to try everything that was asked of me, to show up time and time again, to get my hopes up, to have false starts and stops for 10 years, that almost break, broke my soul. Mm. I just felt so embarrassed. And I was like, wow, people, I just wonder what people think, you know? You reveal a lot about your relationship with substances and alcohol and obviously I'm really candid about both of your parents being in AA and having their own relationships with alcohol drugs and getting high how do you think about your journey would you say addiction yeah okay I would not in the sense of how people usually think about it I think yeah Because for me, addiction isn't just one substance, but I have acted like an addict so many times. Mm -hmm. I've acted like an addict to attention, stimulation, a relationship, a, a, a substance, validation. Like, and I think that there's two type of distinctions, like people that still consider themselves addicts, Mm -hmm. even, even though they're still, um, even though they're sober, that's so interesting. And that's what I think the program does a lot of the time. They're like, no, 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 I'm I have an aunt who's been sober for 50 years. She still calls herself an addict. Yeah. And I think that that's what I wanted to kind of discuss in the book too, that you can not have a relationship with substances anymore, but still believe that, you know, at any moment it could happen. But I, but I also like, and I've questioned with my mom before too. I'm like, why do you identify as this thing? Yeah. You don't drink anymore. Yeah. Well, there's such you a know large, what I'm saying? there's such a large spectrum. Yeah. And I feel like with people I know who've been in AA or who've, you know, realize that it like doesn't serve their lifestyle. I mean, I have friends who like, I would by no means categorize them as addicts, but they're like, my life is better without alcohol. And they use the term sober. But when we think sober, we think you're sober from being addicted. And with my mom, and she talked about this a little bit on an episode with me, but like hers was, I am not my best self when I drink. And she was able, which I know is like really rare to just kind of make that decision and stick with it. Um, Strong. Re- yeah. But I almost don't, of course, I believe my mom's so strong, but everyone's journey is different. And I don't it think is. if someone can't flip the switch that they're not as strong, you know, it's It like, rarely happens with like a, no, yeah. a switch flip. Um, but when it does, that's freaking great. Right. But yeah, there are so many different, different ways that it can look. And, f- but I think the feeling is, it's coming from the same place. It's like, am I like trying to numb something? Am I trying to suppress or, or feed my lowest self, Mm -hmm. like how does this make me be someone I'm proud of? Does it? Yeah. Yeah. While you're recording your third album, you wrote a really powerful, harrowing story that happened with you and your mom when she was sending you some, some texts that were, I would arise fear in any, in any daughter. Um, and you left the recording studio to go to her hotel room and find that she was in a really dark place and had even written some goodbye notes to you. And, almost wondering like what would happen if I hadn't have left the studio to come to her. Is that a story that you had been unpacking in therapy? Was it something that when you wrote on paper for the first time in this book, you were like reprocessing because any moment we think we can lose someone to addiction is, is traumatic. I had processed it a lot. 
because to it was for me one of the most it was like a hinge point in my life it 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 was so scary it was so scary and the way that memory works is so interesting too or the things that you know stick with us or still hurt and i believe that when you open up about certain things that it allows other people to open up and uh, feel less weird. And I, I still hope that it's okay that I shared that story. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I, I love my mom, and I, I don't want to paint a picture that, that is unfair. That's like really my desire with this book is just to, to share but be fair. And everyone has like their moments. Not everyone is a saint 24-7 or perfect 24-7. And I really respected the hell out of your candidness in the book, even talking about yourself. It's not only that you're talking about some of these darker times with your family or your mom, but you're also revealing how you were unfaithful in a relationship or you had this insecure thought. My God, my entire 20s were a fucking (laughs) dumpster fire. I can't believe I'm still here, honestly. Well, and I was just like, Oh my, oh my God, I can't believe she's writing this, but also, I can't but also <laughs> thank you because we all have that. We literally all have something we could write on a piece of paper that no, it's not like our best day. And I think we need more of that because otherwise we all live in our own lives and think like, if I'm not perfect or I have this thought or I make this mistake or I hurt someone I love, I'm a terrible person. But it's like, we all hurt people we love at times. We all let people down. We all have moments where we're not our best self. So I like really admired your vulnerability and I think it's going to help a lot of people feel comfortable owning that parts of them that have been the parts we've worked on because hopefully we're all working on ourselves. Totally. (laughs) I think that by even saying something out loud helps to diffuse the shame and shame is not a helpful emotion. I've carried so much shame Mm -hmm. in for different reasons and, and I've just kind of like stacked it up like Jenga and been like, oh, here's my shame, Jenga. And uh, I'm just like toppling it over. Like right. it's all out there. So I love the word redemption. I love that people can make mistakes and are still worthy of love. Yeah. That's still a- worthy of – yeah respect I feel like society forgets that nowadays it's like if you fuck up you're canceled yeah it's over yeah you're out right but it's like I I I think of the uh I think it's a bible quote don't throw stones in a glass house or let he who is without let he who is without 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 sin sin cast the first first stone." stone yeah I love that. Something I'm dying to talk to you about as a fellow binge eater. I okay. Mean, literally, <laughs> JoJo, all in college, it was restrict, fit into my high school jeans, mm-hmm. like starve myself, and then come home at night. All my roommates would go to sleep, and I will eat everything in the pantry. Absolutely. I will go scrambled eggs to ice cream to cereal to a power bar. Like, none of it yep, makes sense you get together. It. I did. And actually, I pulled a quote because it spoke to my core. You said, Sometimes I wished I had the willpower and discipline to be anorexic. Binge eating was counterproductive to my entire life structure. And yet at the end of the night, I felt like a bottomless pit and wanted to gobble up everything in sight like Miss Pac-Man, trying desperately to fill the void I felt from not being good enough. You could have pulled that from my diary. No, it, it's so, it's such, I, I hate that you relate, but so many of us do. Yeah. I know so many of us do. And, and, and with this particular flavor of disordered eating yeah. I think we also embody a lot of shame because it's so counterproductive to what we would really because we try so hard to restrict right. during the day no I sometimes feel like I don't want to glamorize any eating disorders no of course not but society praises the starvation and then we almost look at the binging as like what gluttonous was like I was taught in my religion school it's like a, yes. it's a deadly sin right so that's how we embodied it probably right. and that just it's such a vicious vicious cycle I used to feel you know, this, the, the someone knowing about like how much food I was consuming was like, I felt so much shame about it. And is this the first time you've opened up about your disordered eating? Maybe, maybe I just didn't, I just didn't know how to talk. I just didn't know. Right. Just didn't know. And did you have any thoughts about like any, this specifically as an example, you know, do I really want to share this? I'm going so far in all these areas. Right. Do I reveal this? Because actually the first time the world 
not the world because I'm not you, but my small community Girl, please. <laughs> found out about um, my binge eating was kind of like by accident. I did this interview and, you know, when they get you talking and then you talk for 40 minutes and then they pull like the worst two minutes and yep. they had like me saying, I go home at night and I eat everything, you know, and then they had like B-roll, not even me, a girl reaching for fries, pizza. And I was like, this is so like, I feel exploited. Yeah. And then that was just posted. And I didn't want to share it. I didn't like promote the article. Right. But people saw it. And then I got like the, all these messages of, oh my God, this is the same thing I do. Because there's so much shame around it. So I like too didn't have necessarily a plan to put right. that out there. Yeah. For, for me as well, no plan. But as I was writing this book, mostly in sequential order, I actually waited to write the first two chapters until I wrote the rest of the book because I did not know where to begin. I was so just like, I, I don't know. And then we just get the rest of it done. But I realized how much of a part of my life this was. How obsession over food and hyperfixation over finding relief at the end of the night when I could finally just like let myself go mm -hmm. because I was so like wah, 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 trying to you live up to whatever person's expectation of what I should be eating and you know carrying um salad dressing spray in my purse and being like this is how seriously I'm taking the diet that you guys want me on Wait, what's salad dressing spray <laughs> well amino acids you know like a liquid amino acids and then mixing it with olive oil and you know just wanting to be like no 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 I won't have the ranch dressing or I won't have the balsamic because that would be too many calories I, I'm gonna make my own I feel like all disordered eating girlies have like a salad dressing story because totally. mine was this very specific kind I had that was 60 calories a tablespoon and I would just go one tablespoon two tablespoons and I bring it in my little Tupperware and that was all the dressing I was allowed what are we doing? Yeah. So I realized how much this was like running, running my mind. And I'm like, I just, freedom, I've realized. I'm a Sagittarius. We're the, the seekers of the Zodiac. We want wide open spaces. We want to explore. And freedom is like one of the pillars of what I value the most. I was so not free. I was so like, I... I'm not going to blame it on anyone else. I agreed to being like, yes, I agree that I need to be a size zero. You know what I mean? I agree that I'm gross and and I need to change myself to be acceptable. Was that impressed upon me? Yeah. But at a certain point, I just, it doesn't feel good to be like, I'm a victim. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, things happen. And uh, it was a big part of my life. I want to go further into this because I really admire your mindset of accountability of like how do I recognize my role or what I can control because even if people wrong us or do things that lead us down a path that wasn't good for us we can talk about that all we want but like we have to make change because we can only control ourselves have you always had that mindset because I think nine out of ten people especially when everyone reads your story it would be easier to point fingers and it takes immense strength to try to say, okay, well, I'm here and like, how can I get myself to where I want to be? My therapist brought up this term to me at a certain point and she's like, there's this spirit of learned helplessness that you're identifying with. She's like, you're strong. Like you're not helpless. Like you feel like you're, you know, backed in a corner or like you can't do anything. Like you can, you can make different choices. You can relate to people in a different way. You can say, I don't want to fight with you. I actually am going to disengage from this. I don't want to make that same choice anymore. You can stop feeling insane by making different choices. And um, I'm, I'm grateful that she was like, you're acting, you know, she, she didn't say you're acting like a victim. She, she really for years was like, any person who went through what you went through would, you know, feel X, Y, Z. Um, she validated my feelings. But at a certain point, I'm like, I'm so sick of myself. I'm so tired of feeling like a victim. I'm so tired of being angry at everybody. I'm so tired of being so jaded and resentful. So you did for a, a period of time. Yes, I think so. I don't know if people outwardly, maybe my team or close people to me definitely experienced that. But I don't know if fans necessarily felt that. I really have no idea. But I just felt, yeah, a lot of anger and sadness. And that's why I was self-medicating. You know, I just like, I can't, I won't survive. I won't survive if I don't write a new narrative. And so essentially you're realizing it's not productive for me to have the poor me turn to the substances, blame others. Like at some point that's not getting me anywhere. So the only thing I can, I can control is myself. At some point. Yeah. 100%. At some point I was like, Hmm, I'm going to 
die of addiction like my dad did in in some way. It might not be in the same way, but like I'm no better or worse. Like why would that – I think that for a lot of people – it's a dissatisfaction. It's a disconnection between who they really are and, or their potential and, and how they're showing up in the world mm -hmm. and, um, have allowing other people to, to be in the driver's seat of my life, um, or to not be the director of it. I just, I was concerned mm -hmm. for my future if I kept going on that way. You talk about your love for your dad and how much you tried to do to help him and even like flying him out to LA and bringing him to the place that like you had checked out and doing all that you could. And, you know, we can't like save people who don't want to be saved and exactly can bring a horse to water and can't make a drink. How have you learned to live with grief? Mm. I just... I think in the beginning when he passed, because it's been almost nine years, I dove into work and I've, and I've done, I've done that same thing of just been like still, still weeping all the time, still letting the tears come through, but being like, I'm going to distract myself. I'm going to busy myself so much that I, I'm not going to completely crumble. So I think that that's a, a way and that can be of saving grace actually to have something to be, to show up for, to have something to be excited about that's that's different and um I would say my family and friends are a huge part of being able to talk about my dad or other people I've lost and keep them alive talk about the good things talk yeah. about the weird things too and and not um and I believe that the people that we lose are still a part of us still with us sometimes I I'm like you motherfucker, you should be here. Like, you know, and <laughs> and that's how I think of it. Um, so it's the bittersweet. Grief is you only feel the depths of that grief because you loved them so much. Mm. And that's that, ooh, life is so life is so beautiful and and painful. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that accepting that, like, no one makes it out of here alive. I don't know, it's easier said than done. They say that it's not over when the person takes their last breath, but it's the last time that their name is said. Mm. One of my favorite quotes when thinking about grief and healing, and we can like also feel the people that we've lost or we've loved, like in in the energy and the environment around us, in the little yes, godwinks. In the and godwinks, yes. I think it's awesome, like how you've honored his story and the relationship that you guys had that was so special throughout your book. Oh, thank you. Something I couldn't let you leave here before we talk about is the fact that you did galentines at taylor swift's house <laughs> i literally if i it was i was on my phone because i was reading the digital copy your team sent but if i had a book i would have been like like smelling the book like reading this this part like every detail i feel like i've had a dream where i was at taylor swift's doing arts and crafts with an in and out truck in the backyard and you lived it <laughs> <laughs> i did i did that was a really beautiful moment yeah. of you know i think if you grew up in the early 2000s, you saw women pitted against each other all the time. And that Galentine's Day that she had some people over to was so pure and so sweet and not at all like the, do you remember a show called Celebrity Deathmatch where like, <laughs> you don't, okay, so I'm older, <laughs> where Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera like had to fight it out and like as physically cl as claymation versions of themselves. Oh. Yes. No, I don't. So to see her and Selena Gomez just being real friends to each other and to just just to be girls together was just really a beautiful thing. I loved how when you talk about your friendship with Selena, you said that she was so nice, so down to earth and really was just an awesome friend. But you mentioned, of course, like I had moments of whether it was jealousy or envy, just kind of looking at her trajectory versus mine. But then you throw in this comment of, but also like, when you reach that level of success, you can't really go outside the house. You have security with you all the time. I'm curious, what was your view of success when you were aspiring mm. to be the next big thing? And what's your view of success now as you look at everything you've done to today? When I was aspiring, when I was a wee little girl, I saw success as being on TV, having songs on the radio, being famous, you know, and, and, performing for people and 
you know, I had visions of rocking a crowd and, and, you know, I was inspired by all those divas that I looked up to. And the thing is, I, I got to do that at 13. Like that's, I had a number one at 13. So I think it's really weird <laughs> to do, to kind of reach that milestone before you have your period. And my view of success after 20 years as JoJo is now happiness, freedom, being able to not worry about money, being able to make choices and have people who I love around me and us work together and do cool things together and do work that I'm proud of. That's what I can live with. That's what I want to look in the mirror and be like, I'm having a good time. Mm -hmm. I think I'm good at this. And if I can't do that, then I, you know, I need to go sit down and go to the desert and just shut up for a few days, or, you know, because I'm just like, what am I doing? But I think it's about having fun, making a good living, having people who are close to me and who, who know me and I know them and living a life full of love. I think that's what it is. It's cool. Your older view of success really had to do with the involvement of other people and like what they thought or if they were liking it and your current version of success has nothing to do with anyone else but you which I love because it's oftentimes you can't be happy unless you get these things from other people or everyone thinks you're the best or that this is successful but success can be redefined as anything we want so I think that's so powerful your current metric of success is like if you go to bed at night feeling good about you yeah and about the day's work that I've done or mm -hmm. about like I said I was going to do this today. I did it to the best of my ability. Like, that's cool. I Or I I was present. I actually really did connect to my truth and connected with others. And I listened. Like, I think that that can be a successful day of just being like, I had a really wonderful conversation with this person. I, I, I learned more about them. I hopefully helped them in where they're at. Like, there's just more to life than popularity and of course because of all my highs and lows I had to accept that my sense of self can't be attached to any other metric other than from within it just can't I can't survive I love it that's it retweet <laughs> sending it out thank you so much for coming on real pod I so appreciate it it's been like I said an honor to sit down with you last last two things I'm gonna rapid fire first of all the Marvin's room cover you did I was in high school had this like shitty boyfriend I think he was cheating on me and that uh. came out and I was like this is my life thank you Jojo <laughs> so just oh, wanted God. to tell you that thank you for reading my book of course I so appreciate thank it thank you Joanna <laughs> <laughs>